Three have been arrested for the Twitter hack, the boot hole vulnerability creates bigger problems, and Rite Aid used facial recognition technology in hundreds of stores. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for August 4th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. On to the news, and I will try to keep this short and sweet, but we do have an update on the Twitter hack. I want to thank Joel and Justin on Patreon for sending these updates my way. Twitter posted some updates about the Bitcoin scam and God Mode hack that we saw a few weeks ago on Thursday, detailing more information about what happened. We also now know who who was behind the attack allegedly. Now, according to the update, Twitter says a few specific employees were targeted in a phone spear phishing attack. Not all of those employees had access to the account management tools, so the attackers targeted several different employees in order to find ones that did. The company stated that the attack, and I quote, relied on a significant and concerted attempt to mislead certain employees and exploit human vulnerabilities to gain access to our internal systems. So yeah, it was social engineering and a targeted phishing for credentials. Twitter also explained that they are improving methods for detection and prevention of inappropriate access to internal systems. They also mentioned that they will be limiting access to internal tools and taking a more sophisticated approach to the security of those account management tools as well. Later on Friday, we started seeing reports of arrests having to do with this hack. Now on July 31st, the FBI, IRS, US Secret Service, and Florida law enforcement arrested Graham Clark, a 17-year-old in Tampa, on charges related to the Twitter hack. Two others were arrested on the same day, including Nima Fazelli of Orlando, Florida, and Mason Shepard from the UK. Now Shepard was charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and international access to a protected computer. Fazelli was charged with aiding and abetting the intentional access of a protected computer. And the third is Clark, who, according to an affidavit released on Friday, was the main attacker. Now, Clark claimed to be a Twitter IT employee, and he social engineered an employee to give him access. He is charged with organized fraud, several counts of communications fraud, and fraudulent use of personal information and access to a computer or electronic device without authority. Agents were able to pinpoint the attacker because allegedly Clark used his personal driver's license to verify on Coinbase and Binance, and he used his own accounts to transfer some of the stolen Bitcoin. Fazelli did the same, and Shepard was paid for stolen usernames. The three are facing various fines and prison time, with Clark being charged as an adult. Hey, I want to talk about Boot Hole. Yes, you heard me right, that is what it's called. Boot Hole is a new critical vulnerability that affects billions of devices around the world. It resides in the Grub2 bootloader and it can allow an attacker to bypass secure boot and gain privileged, persistent stealth access to systems. Boot Hole is being tracked as CVE 2020-10713 and it was found by security researchers at Eclipsium, an enterprise security company. Now on machines, Secure Boot is used to load up important components, including the operating system, and it ensures that the boot process itself is cryptographically sound by only allowing proper authorized code to boot. It's built into the UEFI, or UFI as I like to say, so users don't even really see what's happening on the back end. It makes it very streamlined and simple. Grub2 handles everything by automatically booting into the operating system, but all techies have probably had to mess around at one point or another in the UFI. Now, Secure Boot keeps machines safe during that boot up process, but Boot Hole is a buffer overflow and it affects all versions of Grub2, hitting the bootload on a config file, which researchers noted is not signed in the same way as other files, and it can leave a door open for attackers to break that bootloader trust. 
Also of note is the fact that an attacker would already need to compromise the device in some way in order to take advantage of this attack. They would already need administrative privileges, for example. Now, as an example, an attacker could use another vulnerability to replace the default bootloader with a vulnerable version of Grub2 to exploit boot hole. Physical access could be necessary in order to replace the regular files with malicious ones, but not always so. Now, since this happens during the boot process, anti-malware software on an operating system may not even detect the malicious code. To fix this issue, it's not as simple as just patching the systems via software, since attackers could replace the bootloader altogether. New bootloaders would need to be signed and deployed, while vulnerable ones would need to be revoked completely. Each affected system would need updated lists of revoked bootloaders, and new ones would need to be signed by certificate authorities. It's a whole process. Even hardware makers need to get involved in the event that they provision their own factory keys and versions of Grub2. Many distros are releasing advisories, including Microsoft, Red Hat, Canonical for Ubuntu, Debian, and more, but mitigations and timelines for patches could take a very long time since updates to bootloaders often make older machines unstable or even unusable. Microsoft, for example, has stated in their own reports that they will make updates available for interested parties, but they will not push an update since it could brick some devices. Interested organizations and admins should test devices to ensure that they are recoverable before trying to push updates. Very important. Some manufacturers have started implementing updates, and we are seeing unbootable patched machines. For example, Red Hat has an available patch, but it's making devices running RHEL 7.8 and 8.2 stop booting entirely. CentOS's patch is also rendering it unresponsive, so now Red Hat is saying don't apply the patches until they can fix these issues. More reports of issues with the patch started rolling in from other manufacturers and distros as well, including Ubuntu, Debian, and Fedora. So be careful out there and make sure that you have some kind of backup plan in case it fails. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. Make sure to check out these amazing new fur baby photos from my hush puppy perk level patrons who are awesome for sending them in. They're adorable. Thank you very much. Also, a new perk has been added on Patreon. On. Now, as a subscriber, you will get access to action alerts automatically. So anytime there's a new vulnerability that's announced, a new breach, I will share details on Patreon so that you can update, you can patch your systems, and you can find those flaws ASAP. I might as well because I'm researching that stuff constantly. Also, a big announcement that I have been waiting for and I can't wait to implement this. When I hit my next goal on Patreon, I'm going to be signing up for Patreon's merchandise tool that I just got access to, which means that you will get reoccurring merch or swag whenever you are a new or an existing patron. So that means that rewards will automatically ship to you worldwide after you've pledged for a set amount of time. I will add new merch tiers, but current tiers will also unlock merch rewards. So that includes things like t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, stickers, pretty much anything that Patreon offers. <laughs> this is alongside the current goal of an audio podcast because there's honestly so much to cover in security and privacy. I never have time to discuss everything in these episodes. So if you want to see me cover more InfoSec news as an audio podcast or even a second episode of ThreatWire each week, check out the next Patreon goals to see how you can help make that happen. My Patreon fam voted for this story to be included in the show today. Facial recognition is a headline this entire year for varying reasons from protests to face masks. Well, Reuters published a report and an investigation into the pharmacy chain called Rite Aid here in the US, where they cited many sources and internal documents alleging that the chain deployed facial recognition technology in over 200 stores, including 75 just in LA and New York areas, finding that the technology was heavily used in low-income and non-white neighborhoods. Now, Reuters claims the technology in question is tied to the Chinese government. They explained this was originally implemented eight years ago, and when contacted, Rite Aid confirmed via exchanges with the media outlet that this was indeed true. 
Rite Aid claims it's used to deter theft and to protect staff from violence in the stores. Rite Aid has since said all cameras have been turned off and they have ceased the use of the facial recognition software due to larger industry conversations. Apparently, it's pretty easy to still spot these cameras in the store. They hang from poles, the cameras are rectangular, and they feature a model number, either IHD23 or there's a serial number on them with the vendor initials of DC. Now, the software would record faces and match those previously engaging in potential illegal activity and send a notification to loss prevention or security agent smartphones. Agents would then be dispatched to the store floor if needed. Now, while Rite Aid claimed that they notified customers with a note on their website and signage in stores, Reuters did not find policy signage in some stores that they visited in person. Systems varied as well, but one from DeepCam LLC, who works with a firm in China, though there's no evidence that the data collected was actually sent to any third parties. DeepCam LLC software was used to phase out older technology in Rite Aid called Face First. Now, while Rite Aid says that they have stopped collecting this data, it might be worthwhile to continue wearing face masks in retail stores since recent studies have shown that error rates have been shown between 5% up to 50% error for masked faces when software is used for facial recognition. Now, NIST came out with new research on 89 of the best commercial applications of facial recognition algorithms, showing that they are experiencing these error rates in people using face masks using digitally applied masks to photos. Technically, this study is being used for development of these technologies since the pandemic has created this new consideration for these kind of companies. This means that there were also more false negatives where the software would fail to match a person to a face rather than more false positives, which would be where the software would match a face to an incorrect one. It's pretty interesting stuff and the entire link is down below for the study. Now, before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to David, Sam, Jasmine, Sarah, Bill, Timothy, Matthew, Smartin, Peter, Jason, Michael, James, Patrick, Julia, and Tutu. 532 who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. You are so amazing and I appreciate you. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.